Pittsburgh, been working with glass since 1970. Stained glass to begin, started blowing glass in 74. Taught myself the fundamentals from a book to begin with. Thought I taught myself enough to get into graduate school and did and still had a whole lot to learn. So my graduate school experience was a learning rather than developing my art. But I studied with uh, Kent Ibsen uh, in Virginia Commonwealth University, one of Harvey's first students. And um, so I don't know what generation that makes me, but I'm still alive and kicking. So I was a traditional blower, uh, years and years, made a lot of paperweights, small <coughs> sculptural items, nothing terribly involved. And got really into cold working as I began to develop some sculptural things that I needed equipment and abilities beyond an old slurry grinder that I built out of a cut out piece of metal and I'm, I'm pretty much a build-it-yourself kind of guy. Finding that um, the diamond tools that I could find available at the time were not really sufficient or the quality that I needed and I'm sure there were good quality products out there, it was just there was not a good centralized place to find what you needed. Developed some tools for myself and after a year or two thought, hmm, maybe I could uh, market these and get into the, the diamond tooling. And I would say now that probably 95% or more of what I do is with the tools that we find, create, develop for, uh, for glass people. Um, I am his glass works and this is by no means a sales pitch. Yeah, you're safe there. Through, our, through my presentation, there will be a number of uh, slides or snippets of videos that we have on the web that are really there more for educational than um, development. Uh, and I just have a whole lot of fun with what I do. And I hope that that comes across in what I'm doing. Um, I've had the luxury of working with artists pretty much around the world. Um, Beginners, very established, factories, schools, I've been exposed to a lot and I would say most of what I've learned to know is what I've learned from other glass artists. Um, I'm by no means inventing every step in, in cold working. Now I've been exposed to a lot and I love brainstorming with people, developing their processes, thinking outside the box, you want to do something strange, well, I'll come up with some strange ideas and together you might be able to find a new way of doing what you want. This talk is going to begin with a very broad and simple overview of cold working, the equipment, techniques, things to watch for, not to watch for, pros and cons of different kinds of equipment. I presume you're all here because you've either do cold working or you're planning on it or you have done it and you hate it so much you're looking for an easier way. I will try to uh, be helpful and my talk is hour and a half long and I'm not going to sit up here and talk for an hour and a half. I'm hoping the latter part will be question and answer generated. Through my talk I'm going to be talking about machinery and things that uh, I don't always use. So if someone has experience with a particular machine and you hear me saying something is really wrong about it, please chime in. Um, I don't want to presume to know it all and I do want to know it all so I want to know the right things and if you know more than I do you are my asset and I'll cut you in on my fee, which is not much. <laughs> There'll be little snips of uh, some of the strange ads we've had too. We, we try to have a whole lot of sense of humor with our, with our work. Life's too short to be serious. And I promise to tell you 80% of what I know because I've forgotten the other 20%. Basically, what is cold working? There's my strangest ad and people around the world follow me. I can things anyway. Um, but we're going to be talking about grinding, laminating, polishing, whatever can be done to glass after it comes out of the kiln, the annealer, the furnace. I want it to be question driven and take notes of, of questions you want to ask. It would probably be less disruptive if after I'm done with this thing uh, we can hit the questions and answers rather than interrupting. But if it's pressing, eh, jump in. Glass is obviously a very beautiful medium. Uh, However, whatever form, broken glass can be really pretty. Uh, but when you take chunks of glass and you get into cold working, refining, developing, um, you're just going to be making some really beautiful things. The cold working process, though, one of my favorite lines is we all do the exact same thing differently. So what's going to work for you is not going to work for you. Thoughtful process going into the glass 
should show. And I think we've all seen a lot of glass that should not have been made. <laughs> I'm guilty of it. <laughs> in fact, I made a t-shirt that says, just because you make it in glass doesn't mean you should. This is going to be a, this quick little step show, uh, working with a piece for Paul Stankard. First is bonding with uh, the epoxies, the hexyl, pre-shaping. I'm making a sphere form. I have a sphere grinder that will rough it down all the way to the polish and the final object. You know, the beginning of your glass is going to be kind of gnarly. Um, can't see through the surface well because it's got chill marks from your tools or whatever. The final piece should be thoughtful, should be finished. Uh, and the better you finish it, uh, the more satisfied your collectors are going to be, the more satisfied you're going to be. It is the presentation of what you do. It's what your name goes on. So the goal is to be as efficient with what you're doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm old, but that's not how I do sandblasting. Though I wasn't there, you know, why reinvent the wheel? I mean, there's good equipment out there. Some people can build it themselves. Uh, there are many manufacturers of all kinds of equipment. Early cold working, much of it is presumed as far as I know. Uh, historians may differ on how different cuts or polishes or shapes were made. Okay, uh, just let them fight over it and we can just get, enjoy what they did because that's where we're at. We, we're interested in the final object. We're not selling our process. Um, sometimes what we do is very indicative of the process, but uh, not the, um, the process is not what we're selling. That's somebody grinding by hand a telescope mirror blank on a, on a curved piece of stone with, with grit and big chunk of mirror round, around, around. Early cold working, mostly done by hand um, or by semi mechanical. Uh, this guy's cranking on one hand and grinding with the other uh, before they invented motors or before they could afford a motor. There's a lot of ways of working on it and I think this really looks like it would be fun to do for eight or twelve hours a day. Then we step into the Iron Age. Uh, most of us have seen these kind of wheels. Most of us have used them. Slurry grinding is pretty much the technology uh, that, that's out there before diamonds came along and it's very efficient and it's frequently the best step, uh, the best process for, for grinding. That's me back when I had hair. Different ways of decorating and working with the glass. These are stone or copper wheels with, uh, with, with grit. Um, just old tech, but very efficient. Uh, contemporary cold working, and we come with, with diamonds. Electroplated diamonds are a single layer of diamonds on a metal disc. It's like sandpaper without the paper. You just grind away. Um, very efficient. Size matters with what you're grinding on, on diamond. Uh, sometimes the larger it is, uh, the slower the diamond will grind. And very large surfaces frequently are best with a slurry grinder. Diamond is not for everyone. Um, it is my personal favorite, and it's not for every application. Um, they get expensive. Then there's a lot of people out there selling them. Uh, these are centered wheels, wheels that have diamond embedded in metal around the rim. Uh, just a different way of holding the diamond, and as the diamond grinds, uh, slowly the metal is worn away and new uh, diamonds will become exposed. They're very long-lasting, uh, just a whole different process to, uh, to manage with the diamonds. And, and these, can, these can last probably 20 times longer than electroplated diamonds. Uh, these are uh, resin bonded diamonds, a different way of holding a diamond. When the diamond grinds in a resin, the diamond actually moves around and tumbles within the resin as it's grinding and leaves a very fine finish. So a, like a 325 grit in a resin can leave a finish almost like a 500 or 600 grit. So there's many different ways of, of holding the diamonds. Uh, these are wheels that are made in the Czech Republic. I mean, there are people all over the world coming up with really cool tools for, for working stone and glass. This has an aluminum oxide abrasive embedded in the wheel, so you get all the way down to the hub, you have abrasive. They can be shaped to a number of different profiles. It's just another way of doing it. And technology is bringing out all kinds of new, uh, new products. A couple images of some 3M belts called Trizac. Uh, it's aluminum oxide, but it's embedded in a surface on the belt. Uh, just another step, a new way of cold working glass. Um, it's encapsulated in some kind of resin that, of course, they don't talk about. <laughs>